Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and what it takes to cultivate a healthy mind, body, and spirit. I'm Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co-host, Dr. Reed Robinson, and I discuss the neuroscience of psychedelics and mental health. We do a little intro to the basic neurochemistry, talk about some the major neurotransmitters that are implicated in mental health. We discuss how psychotropic medicines affect neural circuits and why they aren't always effective. We contrast psychotropics, traditional psychotropic medications, with psychedelics and how psychedelics affect neural circuitry. Reed and I even wax a little philosophical on this episode, and we go on our customary tangents. I really hope you enjoy it. Um, I also wanted to just take a moment and thank those listeners who have left reviews for the podcast. I know every podcast you listen to probably asks for those reviews. We do that because we are egomaniacs and we want to hear praise, but also because positive reviews help elevate the signal. It tells you know the algorithms to the, hey, this podcast is good. And then that exposes us to more people who might benefit from our content. So I just wanted to read one of the reviews that was left on Apple Podcasts for us. This is, of course, a five-star review. My ego could not handle reading anything other than a five-star review, but it's entitled, Seriously Good Stuff, Food for the Soul. I love tuning into this podcast whenever I need a reminder that mindfulness, healing, and radical growth is possible within our oh-so-disconnected world. And I definitely share about it often with fellow psychonauts and those with a focus on growth. I typically only listen to podcasts that engage me in revealing my inner self and give me a new perspective. And Stephen Reed definitely blow my mind open every time I give this podcast a listen. So thank you for that very thoughtful, very kind, very generous review. And prepare your minds, folks, to be blown wide open. Reed, let me tell you a story about a man named Phineas Gage. Phineas was an American railroad worker back in the 1840s. And in 1848, he had drilled a big hole in a rock like they do when they're trying to blow stuff up. And he used something called a tamping iron to pack in the blasting powder. And then they put sand and stuff on top of the blasting powder, which they then light to blow up the rock. The hole uh, channels the blast down into the rock. And this tamping iron is about an inch and a quarter in diameter, three and a half feet long, weighs like, I don't know, 13 pounds. And he turns to look, I think to his right or his left, I don't remember which, but he turns to the side and opens his mouth to talk to somebody as he's tamping this iron in. We don't know exactly what happened, if maybe he didn't use the sand, but the iron sparked against the rock and ignited the blasting powder, which shot this tamping iron like a Sabo missile through this guy's face. So it went, I think, through his uh, jaw, his upper upper and lower jaw, and out the top of his head, and landed some 80 feet away. And, uh, you know, you'd think that having a a 13-pound, three-and-a-half-foot rod, basically a giant piece of rebar, shot through your brain would have killed you. But Phineas was a resilient lad, and (laughs) it did not kill him. In fact, uh, it was reported by witnesses that he sat up in the cart as they carted him back to town and that he was conversant. He could talk. Um, Of course, he was having some trouble talking, but went to a doctor, uh, several doctors, and eventually, you know, he he recovered. He lived for maybe, I don't know, 13, 12 years after that. Um, But people reported that the biggest change, apart from his physical appearance, was his personality that as a result of this localized brain injury, Phineas went from being a reasonably trustworthy guy, fairly industrious, fairly conservative, to uh, a very different version of him. And I, and I looked up the description, and I just I wanted to read it word for word because it's in that sort of 1840s old-timey language that I just love. So this was the description by one of the folks that knew Phineas. The equilibrium or balance, so to speak, between his intellectual faculties and animal propensities seems to have been destroyed. He is fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which was not previously his custom, manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint or advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times obstinate, yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operations, which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible. 
a child in his intellectual capacity and manifestations, he has the animal passions of a strong man. Previous to his injury, although untrained in the schools, he possessed a well-balanced mind and was looked upon by those who knew him as shrewd, a smart businessman, very energetic and persistent in executing all his plans of operation. In this regard, his mind was radically changed, so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said he was no longer Gage. So forgive the radio announcer voice, but I just love that. Gage was no longer Gage. You know Mm -hmm. what's interesting? We didn't know much about brain science back then. I mean, I wasn't there, but (laughs) but in reading about it, um, it's, it's fascinating to me to see things like in, uh, in the old reports, like when you were reading, it'll say, uh, the iron passed through the regions in his brain uh, and took out the organs of benevolence and veneration and mm. influenced his character. <laughs> um, because his, his uh, personality did change. He became vulgar, profane, and animalistic. Yeah, impulsive too. Which uh, means that Rod probably knocked out a good chunk of his frontal lobe. Right. Uh, they even said they saw chunks of his, huh. that the rod was covered in brain and, and blood and gore. And, um, but this was sort of the first case, I don't know if first, but one of the most pr- uh, prominent cases in the 1800s where um, they, were, they were thinking about linking brain regions or damage to brain regions to, you know, behavioral phenomenology. Yeah, it's a classic story that if you've had any psychology classes, you've probably heard it or remember this fellow, Phineas yeah. Gage. Yeah, and the, I, the Psych 101 courses I taught, all the, all the textbooks always had the Phineas Gage picture in it and the Phineas Gage story. Do you think uh, Phineas and Ferb was named after him? <laughs> that'd, be a funny, that'd, be, that'd be a funny namesake. I'm named after the, uh, the American Railroad worker that blew off half his head. Yeah, I mean, I don't know any other Phineases. Yeah. It's a cool name though. And it's a compelling story. And it's often the, you know, the story that um, I use to bring up the topic of how much of who we are is attributable to our biology, to just the, the meat between our ears. We had a professor in graduate school who said, are we just meat machines? You know, are Uh we, are we meat puppets? What are we animated by? Um, Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as biological reductionism. And, you know, the philosophical questions do inform the scientific inquiry. They do inform the kind of treatment that we engage in when somebody comes to us for help. So I wanted to to share the story to introduce the, our topic today, which is we're going to discuss neuroscience, uh, but the, specifically the neuroscience of psychedelic medicines and mental health generally. I like it. One of my favorite topics to geek out on and what led me into this field, actually, even my undergrad. Um, I was midway through college when a neuroscience major magically appeared. <laughs> as, mm. So I jumped in as a first cohort. Um, it wasn't too uh, challenging back then from what I hear now, at least as far as undergrad programs go. But, but, uh, but yeah, I, I love this topic. And did you know, Steve, that the h- average human attention span of – is shorter than that of a goldfish. No, no, that's surprising. Although, you know, if, if, uh, and now I'm thinking about my children, that does make a lot of sense. You know, and, uh, what's interesting is that our attention span of roughly like 20 minutes, depending on how you measure it, um, is 10 to 15 minutes shorter than it was a decade ago. Mm. Tells you something about, uh, evolution perhaps in the world we live in. It does make me wonder. I think I, I read this, uh, a, a quote attributed to, I think, Socrates or somebody long, long ago where, you know, being very critical of the invention of written language of, you know, people reading books and and saying things oh. that are very similar to what we say about our kids who are on scroll media or YouTube um, about, you know, it's going to ruin the mind, it's going to ruin the mental capacity that they don't have to memorize the entire uh-huh. Iliad, Iliad or whatever. I remember teachers in high school who would say that about calculators Mm -hmm. like no you don't get to have them nearby Um, do you have any other cool brain facts mm, sure so well you've probably heard that uh our short short short-term memory is optimized to store about seven 
chunks of information, hence the seven digit phone number, mm -hmm. and can store that for about 20 seconds on average. Uh, but, but get this, if your brain were a computer, which it is, um, it could hold mm, a little shy of three million gigabytes of information, which is like, I don't know, a few hundred years of HD TV shows. Wow. That's quite the DVR. Yeah. Yeah. And that uh, information in the brain is traveling on our neurons, the electrical signals at about 150 miles an hour mm -hmm. um, across these hundred billion neurons in your brain. Um, and one more fun fact, there are about a hundred billion stars in the Milky Way. See, the brain just sounds like this incredible miracle of evolution or maybe maybe God created it. Like I'm agnostic about what how it got here, but um, it because it's so complicated, it can go awry in so many challenging ways. You hear that sort of old, I think it's been established to not be true, but the idea that we only use 10% of our brains at any given time. Um, do you have any expert knowledge about whether or not that's true? Well, that's a, it's a funny one and a little bit hard to pinpoint just to complicate it with a, another fun fact is about 95% of our decisions we make, decisions in quotes, are made subconsciously, like mm -hmm. as we move throughout life. So how much, like my question to that question is, what are we talking about? Like our, mm -hmm. you know, conscious use of information, the accessibility of information. Um, yeah, but all these questions are pretty much why I got into this field because I just was blown away by this, how this little three pound gelatinous organ with a hundred billion neurons is responsible for transmitting all of our feelings, our thoughts, our, our perceptions, our emotions, and that we don't understand it. And we're trying to understand it through this brain in our craniums. <laughs> right. Yeah. The brain trying to understand itself is a little trippy. Um, I'm always fascinated about, cause you know, you and I are, you and I are both work in the mental health field and, um, we're even both referred to as doctor, but we, we have very different training paths and those training paths usually result in, in a professional looking at these problems that we have with our minds through different lenses, right? There's the, uh, if you wanted to be really reductionistic about it, there's the biological lens and then there's the sort of behavioral psychological lens. And then you might have people who look at it through the psycho spiritual lens or, um, you know, this, the, uh, sociological lens. Um, but sort of why we are the way that we are is, is a question that is, that we attempt to answer in a lot of different ways. And I remember deciding whether or not I wanted to go to medical school or I wanted to do the PhD route. And one of the big deciding factors, apart from the, my appalling performance in my bio 100 course, which we've discussed on the podcast yeah. before, um, was, you know, I, I had some very influential professors early on who, uh, who influenced me to kind of reject this biological redu reductionistic approach to the human, yeah. the human organism, that we are more than just the sum of the parts of our biology. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a tough question to answer. I don't know how you answer it, but I've, as I've worked with psychedelic medicine, certainly, I've become really, really fascinated about... Um, you know, how much of who we are and how we experience the world is mediated by our neurology, the, mm -hmm. the chemical signals, the electrical signals and the structure in our brain basket. Yeah. That's what I was just thinking of when you started to talk about our different paths into this field and how I just saw this convergence that is happening, um, not only for each of us, right. Mm -hmm. But for the fields in general, psycho psychiatry, psychology, mental health, like therapy and prescribing, coming back together. And um, even with different paths, we're ending up on this in this convergence of like neuroscience, psychology and spirituality um, climbing up this mountain in a in a way that I think neither of us expected when we embarked um, on this professional quest, you know. Not at all. Yeah. If I could go back in time and, and tell my, uh, you know, my, my self who was starting graduate school that he was going to be working with psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and be like, what's a psychedelic? What are, you, like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And, uh, I was also thinking about, um, when you talked about psychedelics being this, um, I don't know, this 
catalyst for our own uh, psycho spiritual um, coming of age uh, Mm -hmm. professionally as well. I was remembering my first ayahuasca experience when I went to the jungle seeking like new tools for the patients I work with. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I was going to try and find some interventions for eating disorders and other mental health conditions, but came away with a hell of a lot more than I bargained for, um, including some more understanding that I can't explain scientifically about my own life and a deepening of my spirituality and a, you know, a new sense of my place in the universe. Like, even though I wasn't looking for God or answers on spirituality necessarily, it's, that's kind of what found me. A lot of this spirituality I'd thrown out with the bathwater in my mm-hmm. scientific pursuits uh, came back with a vengeance. Yeah, my my path back to spiritual exploration is very similar, you know, uh, became very not religious and not spiritual in my 20s. And then, you know, discovering psychedelics and my, I sought ketamine treatment for my depression in, uh, this is after I'd graduated, right? This is, I'm a working professional psychologist helping lots of people, at least doing my best. Um, and that was my first experience with an altered state caused by a, a psychedelic type medicine. It was like, it, it, my experience on ketamine was more real than anything I ever felt, right? I, mm. I uh, was profoundly altered and deeply noetic and... Um, and it just helped, it, it, it raised so many questions that I had foreclosed on about sort of what is reality and our relationship to it that I just, I had to open up the questions again. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was all that was done was a chemical that affected certain channels in my brain and certain chemical releases. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. that's all that really changed. Now that's a trip and that's, I guess, what we'll dive into as we peel away layers of our brains here in a moment. But, mm-hmm. but yeah, the, that's the, the same for me. Like when I began this journey, um, the psychedelic medicine journey, I was very scientifically minded, which I still am. I haven't lost that, but there, but meaning there were some Western walls around my view of the universe. Like I mm-hmm. felt like I could, I could boil anything down to a mathematical equation. If I couldn't, then kind of ignore it uh, right. like consciousness is the sum total of our neural synapses and is a physical manifestation of these neurochemicals floating around our brains but um but then i come out of this with you know saying things to myself and out loud like whoa there is an infinity and we're all part of it and spirit yeah. exists and always has even though we can't see it or quantify it and that maybe consciousness is just the like the universe experiencing itself and like the stuff uh-huh. you that I would previously have judged like oh that's what weird old hippies say like all of Alan a sudden Watts. exactly all of a sudden I'm like oh that's what it means I remember reading in Michael Pollan's book um, I almost said man's search for meaning Michael Pollan did not write man's search for meaning uh-huh. uh, how to how to change your mind um, he was talking about, and maybe this was on a podcast interview with him, but um, how the uh, banal, like the things you would read in a Hallmark card, love is all you need, uh, never feels oh. like never feels more true than when you're on a psychedelic medicine. Yeah, yeah, it's all those cliches come to life. Like mm-hmm. you, all of a sudden, have this embodied knowing of what it is like to move from your head to your heart and like get out of your own way. And these things like, Oh shit, I was, I was afraid of dying. I was afraid of loving. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, the other things like this, just peaceful feeling that everything is as it should be. Right. Things like that. Yeah. It's, it's, I remember, you know, trying to help my clients experience what mindfulness is this abiding non-judgmental presence in the immediate moment, uh, observing with the, the child's mind. Like I had all these fancy words to describe what mindfulness is, uh-huh. but I remember experiencing ketamine and being like, Oh, this is what mindfulness is. Like, this is what it, it certainly not in the, the depth of the experience, but coming out of it a little bit like this, this is exactly what I've been trying to communicate to my clients, but have failed because mindfulness itself is an ineffable kind of experiential phenomenon. Yeah. And I 
I don't love to conclude that it's these things are ineffable. Like mm, I mm. wish there were an intermediate term because I do think we can, as we try, we can get better and better at putting words around them. And there is beauty in the trying, like in the meaning making of trying to describe these things that uh, previously seemed in, in, ineffable, but we're stumbling around and getting closer and closer to. Like I learned a lot from the the talks and writings of Terrence McKenna in that regard, where he would just like do DMT over and over again with the intention of, I'm going to come out and describe what this experience is like because no one really knows how, but I'm going to do it. I know language. I know psychedelics. Mm-hmm. And, and he did it quite well. I'm glad you made that point because I, I think part of um, the, ther- this, the therapeutic process when we leverage the power of psychedelics is the effort to F the ineffable, right? <laughs> the, uh, the effort to, to put to put words to our experience because it, it helps. It's an exercise, if nothing else, in exploring and trying to make sense of. Uh, but there are other mediums to communicate what the experience is like. Sometimes I've seen like an Alex Gray painting or just like a, a, a depiction yeah. with images that is like, okay, that's what I felt or uh, music. You want to know what it's like to be on psychedelics. You just have a tea party with a three or four or five year old. Cause they're <laughs> tripping all the time. Yeah. And, and psychedelics do restore this like, youth like consciousness in a way without giving up that scientific mind um because we have this like this spotlight consciousness or as our egos build up more and more walls um we have mental models and rules that tell us what's not possible that some that the little kids don't have yet and and can make these free flowing connections without their default mode network in the way of uh a lot of magical things in the world right Right. So that term you used, default mode network, is something that, um, you know, people, listeners to our podcast who are familiar with psychedelics, who listen to other podcasts or read other books about psychedelic medicine have probably heard thrown around a lot, the default mode network. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what the, the DMN is? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, psychedelics, the field has done a lot to bring neuroscience into you know, everyday language, lexicon and conversation and the default mode network. Uh, I never would have guessed how um, commonly uh, talked about it would be like five or 10 years ago because it first started to enter um, everyday life through the meditation space um, when um, researchers found that certain mindfulness and meditation practices would um tone it down like the wandering mind is an unhappy mind and we're more happy or at peace when present because the default mode network i see is just a collection of uh neuronal circuits and pathways that is um the neuro the neuronal representation of our ego which is the collection of stories and rules and things that govern who we think we are, um, what we've been through, where we need to be, what we need to do and all that stuff. Yeah. I've heard it described as the, the seat of the monkey mind. Um, but we don't want to imply that this default mode network to the extent that we understand it is a problem all the time. It's, it's yeah. also responsible for our, our ability to, you know, make goal oriented and conceptual thoughts and, to reflect on, uh, con- on ourselves, right? To be self-reflective and introspective, but gone awry, it's also responsible for rumination, perhaps, and at least the seat of um, you know self-reflection that is unhelpful. Yeah, and uh, like we've like we've said before, there's a Zen koan that I love uh, that just kind of in a shocking way illustrates that we need an ego when. Uh, like a student asks a teacher, how much ego do we need? And then the teacher says, just enough so you don't get hit by a bus. Mm-hmm. You know, you need enough so we, we don't bump into each other. So you remember to pick your kids up from school. And yes, it can go awry. Like we were talking about, I think in a recent episode about, uh, like you, I think it was last time on imposter syndrome of how it's uh, adaptive to have a little bit of worry, a little bit of stress, a little bit of conscientiousness, but it would be maladaptive to have these things on hyperdrive where you're just ruminating on things unnecessarily. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's where I, I feel like the psychedelic medicine space can get a little too eager to like dissolve the ego. We talk about the ego dissolving qualities of a psychedelic being one of the potential ways that it's helpful or healing, but uh, and it certainly can be give you a break from that egoic state for all the reasons we've discussed before. But uh, unlike Ryan Holiday's book title, I don't think the ego is the enemy. Yeah. And maybe he's saying it's, you know, egotism is the enemy, but uh, yeah, it's not necessarily the enemy. It's, it's uh, a, a part of self that we need to make friends with and uh, manage. Yeah, I, I agree. It's uh, befriend the ego. <laughs> it's yeah. like that uh, mantra we've also talked about on here of the mind makes a, a uh, terrible master, but a beautiful servant. Like we need our thinking minds, but mm -hmm. there's also much more than that. Which is always like I've, we've used that phrase before and I've pondered it. Like the mind is a terrible master, but a good servant to whom and what? Like the, this gets back to like my old oh, yeah. sort of existential philosophy days. Um, and sometimes what I ponder when I, when I, when I meditate. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, if, is the mind not us? And if it's not us, who's, who's the thing that it's a master of or a servant to? And anyway, we don't have to necessarily go down that rabbit hole, but it's one that I would yeah. often think about in reference to that quote. Yeah. And I guess to summarize, to try and make it, I don't know, maybe simple, maybe not is the default mode network is, uh, toned down, uh, d through certain meditation practices and certain, like psychedelic medicines. And mm -hmm. it's also the, an overactive default mode network is associated with things like, uh, attention deficit disorder and, uh, like the feelings of unhappiness, unease associated with excessive mind wandering um, mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. I haven't looked into this research, but I wonder if there's, there's research about default mode network activation and, um, generalized anxiety disorder. Um, or OCD because the excessive mind wandering, you know, certainly people with GAD who just sort of, but what if, but what if, but what if, but what if it just, it seems like a, a broken record in the default mode that they have a hard time escaping from. Yeah. And, uh, it is, I like looking at the brain through circuits and pathways. Um, in addition to looking at it, through uh, neurotransmitters, um, mm. because neither tells the whole story. And if you look at like the default mode network, it doesn't just involve one neurotransmitter or one brain pathway. You know, there are, it's uh, spanning a lot of regions of the brain, um, as you might expect with what it does it in governing. It's like the watchtower of our brain, or um, mm -hmm. the mission control tower. Yeah. And what you said is a testament to, I think, the evolution of neuroscience and discovering that, that not only, um, are, not only does the brain do a lot of things, but localizing the things that the brain does to just specific regions is an oversimplification and that most regions aren't acting independent of other regions. There, there's network effects, um, the brain communicates with other parts of the brain. The brain communicates with the rest of the nervous system via HPA access and vagus nerve and all this stuff, right? It's heavily influenced by, uh, input from other sensory organs, from bacteria in our guts, and maybe from a soul. Like there's, <laughs> there's so much going on in the mind to say that, uh, oh yeah, I take ADHD medicine so that it activates my prefrontal cortex and then I can pay attention. It's probably a gross oversimplification. Yeah. Yeah. So like when we're, when we're prescribing medications in psychiatry, um, we're actually targeting brain circuitry. Like we're trying to match symptoms to brain circuits mm -hmm. rather than going after a neurotransmitter. And that will become more evident, even though we're giving something called like an SSRI, we're really trying to target someone's like affective symptoms and therefore the ventromedial prefrontal cortex circuits, or we're trying to target their anxiety or their worry loops, which would be their like cortico striatal thalamic loops in the brain. And, uh, you know, meds to think of meds as being that clean of like, um, hitting serotonin alone, um, 
leading to a symptom change. It's just not that easy. It's more like I've heard it described when you're giving an antidepressant. It's like you're pouring a can of oil across the brain and you're um, doing that serotonin reuptake inhibition across a lot of different areas, the ones you want to and the ones you may not want to, and hence the adverse effects um, that might come along with it. Yeah, I like that metaphor of pouring, pouring oil in the brain. Because, you know, we have a lot of these, these oversimplified metaphors that have worked their way into sort of the common lexicon, maybe because of, if you want to be really skeptical, it could be because of um, big pharma and advertising campaigns. But the, the idea of a chemical imbalance, for example, like I am depressed because I have a chemical imbalance and I'm going to take a medicine that's going to restore the balance of chemicals in my brain. Therefore, I won't be sad anymore. Um and I think this, this, you probably know more than me about this, Reed, but the, the idea of a chemical imbalance wasn't necessarily the product of research. Uh, it didn't come out of the medical research. It came more out of the, the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, it was more uh, looking for a simple narrative uh, to, well, if you look at the intentions as positive, to tell mm -hmm. a story about a, a new mechanism of action. But, you know, some people claim it as being a, a negative intention just to sell more drugs. And I think there's, there's a lot of both. I mean, the fact of the matter is we don't fully understand this. We're still learning a ton as we go about how the brain works, how these medicines work that we give. And um, another point is when I first got into psychiatry, I was doing mostly clinical trials and it wasn't all meds. Like I remember doing a blue light therapy for seasonal affective disorder where we'd mm -hmm. have people sit in front of a a light or lamp in the morning and doing a vagal nerve stimulator study for treatment resistant depression where we would surgically implant something on someone's chest and that would intermittently deliver these mild electrical impulses to your left vagus nerve um, that goes up to some mood related structures in the brain like the locus aurelius the raffi nucleus and we would put this little device over people's skin under which the stimulator would be implanted. We'd read the settings and we'd adjust it. And it was just fascinating. And even today in our clinics, we do transcranial magnetic stimulation. A lot of hospitals still do ECT. There's deep brain stimulation out there for mental health conditions. So there's this whole neuromodulation approach to treatment as in addition to the chemicals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good point, right? When, when we intervene at the level of the neurology, it doesn't have to be a chemical intervention. And, you know, there are things you can do behaviorally that alter your neurochemistry. I think, you know, Andrew Huberman's podcast, The Huberman Lab, Huberman being a, a Stanford uh, neurobiologist, is, is great. He's got a lot of good content around these things. He talks about light exposure in the eyeballs first thing yeah. in the morning to set your circadian rhythm so that you can sleep well at night these sort of light sensitive cells at the back of the eye and um, talks about cold exposure. And of course he, he didn't originate all the research on these things. This is stuff that's been ar around a long time. I just like the way he articulates some of the science, but uh, exercise, right? Sleep, your breath, having sex. There's lots of things you do behaviorally that directly affect your neurobiology that affect your mental health. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I don't know why I'm thinking of this, but it's on the topic of, of light, electricity, and how the brain isn't just chemicals, it's mostly an electrical organ. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading in the neuroscience history about this, uh, I don't know, physician or whatever they were called back then, Scribonius, this is around the time of Jesus, who mm -hmm. used a, uh, a torpedo fish to shock patients to deliver an electrical charge as a pain reliever. That was like the <laughs> pain relief of the day. <laughs> Dude, we need to rebrand this podcast and call it Torpedo Fish. Oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, we have a new name for the podcast every week. <laughs> <laughs> or at least so, start a band. Torpedo Fish would be a great name for like a ska band. Yeah, I like it. I like it. So um, more trivia for you then. Um, the brain generates more watts of electricity a day than you need to power an LED light bulb. Um, oh, that's why the robots in the matrix were using human beings as batteries, spoiler alert, but uh, yeah. And then if you look at the other organs, like the heart is another electrical organ that, uh, has this self powered pump 
producing these action potentials that when we like in our research clinic across the parking lot from where we're both sitting, when we do an EKG on everyone before and throughout studies, we're measuring through the skin these millivolts of electricity that the heart's generating so we can trace that wave. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it's it's what makes me think about, um, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people talk about um, vibrations, like emotions vibrate at a certain frequency, or they'll talk about um, electromagnetic frequencies, harmful EMFs. Uh, you need to make sure you turn the Bluetooth off on your cell phone or hit, hit the power, hit the breaker at night so you're not... Uh, sort of bombarded by all this EMF radiation. And, you know, there's a part of me that wants to be like, come on, we don't have good scientific support for this stuff. But then there's another part of me that's like, hey, if our heart is, as you just described, like it, it emits an electrical signal, if our brain is a giant wet electrical organ, it kind of makes sense that this stuff could interfere. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. And, uh, you know, you can look at the, yeah, you can look at the brain through this lens of electricity, you can look at the the heart that way, the whole body, like the fact that we um, at rest, we're producing these like, what is it, 100 watts of power, but mm. in a sprint mode, you can do three or 400 watts, and then we're burning uh, what, 2000 kilocalories a day of food energy in order to go about our daily activities. And calories are just a measure of energy, right? Right. Yeah, the the heat we put off is pretty incredible, and yeah, uh, the way we can modulate that too. Uh, we've talked about you know, we talked about breath work in a recent episode, and referenced Wim Hof, and you know the guy can increase his body temperature and withstand environmental cold just through breath. Yeah, and those those lobster claws that we talked about in that episode of mm. uh, carpal pedal spasms, like you know, it's fueled by the electrical signals go into our muscles, making them over twitch. And um, uh, it's related to the uh, electrolyte balance that we talked about as well. But maybe we should uh, meander back around to neurotransmitters like dopamine or these yeah. chemicals that we talk about in psychedelics of um, what is their job and uh, what are they there for? How might we think about them before we dive into how psychedelics work? Yeah, I like that. So we referenced SSRIs before. You know, a common uh, antidepressant treatment is a selective uh, ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. The idea being, let's uh, and you can correct the science that I get wrong here, though. Read, but <clears throat> block the reuptake, the vacuuming up of serotonin, so that it's there. We have more serotonin hanging out in the synaptic cleft, the place between synapses between neurons. Excuse me. Um, so their brain makes more use of it. Uh, but what does, why do we, why does that help with depression? What does serotonin do in the brain and body that affects mood? Yeah. So to give you an example, like, um, and using the SSRI example, if we first summarize what each of these main neurotransmitters does, and then we look at the action of, of an SSRI, it, uh, lines up with what you just said, that the, chemical model of depression is an oversimplification and the name of an SSRI is not the best um, or not the most accurate uh, depiction of what it's doing um, mm -hmm. because, you know, serotonin is a neurotransmitter of more like social importance, respect, pride, pleasure in the sense of uh, our place in the universe and in communities. Um, some would even call it like, you get serotonin when you have a sense of gaining a a one-up position um, and not something we like to see in ourselves and we can easily see in others, but um, versus dopamine, you know, even more of a pleasure thing that's uh, often called the molecule of more or the uh, the reward neurotransmitter. Yeah, you hear people use phrase like dopamine drip or, you know, I'm on... TikTok and I'm scrolling just to get another dopamine hit, implying that it is a reward neurotransmitter. But you know, you mentioned the molecule of more, which I believe is a title of a book about dopamine. Um, that it it's more the neurotransmitter that drives action than it is yeah. the neurotransmitter that rewards action. Yeah, and you know how I like to think about it or remember it, and this is kind of a trip. But uh, so this thing, evolution, this pervasive force 
like crawling through um, and expanding across all time and all you know species that uh, that leads us towards survival. That's what evolution stumbled upon dopamine as a way for us to find things that help us survive, that help us propagate our genes like sex and food that are highly rewarding, that give you a spike of dopamine. And dopamine is there to drive us towards those so we'll actually survive. And um, when we find them and eat the pizza or have the sex, it, they, that dopamine goes away. And mm -hmm. uh, these reward neurotransmitters or these feel-good ones come on and they come off. Yeah, I've heard it said that uh, you know the human organism did not evolve for happiness; it evolved for survival. And sometimes, what helps us survive in one environment makes us unhappy in another environment. So the mm -hmm. the rewards that you talk about, like the 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 way we respond to, like food, would be a good example. Like really salty, sugary, fatty food, was great when it was scarce because it helped us eat a lot of it when we found it and put on weight for the winter and stuff like that or for famine. But when it's in everything, <laughs> it's uh -huh. that, that evolution, uh, that adaptation has now become maladaptive. Yeah. And it makes sense. Like how do you use the molecule of more to go towards adaptive things that enhance your survival? If it's just everywhere, you're getting bombarded with molecules of more every time you open your phone and swipe. And every time you look around you and see all the pizza boxes, <laughs> and whatnot yeah. and the porn. Um, but uh, it is, I think you make a really good point is the brain is looking for um, ways to turn on the feel good neurotransmitters, the happy neurotransmitters that are released when you see a way to meet a need. They're mm -hmm. released in short spurts because you have to do more to get more. They evolve to reward survival, not be there all the time. Right. Not and be there so, all the time. The four that I would call the happy neurotransmitters or the feel good would be serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, and endorphins. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's debatable, of course, but to break it down, I think those are the ones that are released in short spurts and where you have to do more to get more. Um, but there are these other negative neurotransmitters like uh, cortisol, for example that alert you when things are awry or um, that help you survive more of the stressors or challenges coming at you. And like you said, oversimplification, because cortisol is necessary. If you don't have enough cortisol, that's a bad thing. And uh, the timing of cortisol release also matters. We generally, if we're healthy, have a nice spike of cortisol in the morning that helps us wake up and get going. And then if our circadian rhythm is appropriately tuned, then the cortisol should be like going down right in the evening as we're trying to wind down. Yeah. Yeah. So like our brain is designed or evolved to, I guess, either way, like it, um, depending on uh, where these brains of ours came from, but right. it uh, it's there to protect us from having to like touch that hot stove twice it's mm -hmm. like we've evolved a brain that's good at scanning for evidence of threats sometimes it scans a little too much um, and then sometimes when we've turned on the threat chemical like too much cortisol too often too early in life we've opened this information superhighway in our brain where it might be easy to turn it on a little too quickly too much um, but uh, but they are there for a reason the negative ones also tell us what we need for survival and optimal navigation of life. Like um, going negative in your brain can lead you to bring more social support, which will then release the oxytocin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not your brain killing itself. It's your brain trying to protect itself by giving you a, uh, a learning moment. And sometimes discomfort is the best learning moment. Yeah. And the, the problem is that when we go, when we get, um, when we get stuck in this negative neurotransmitter mode, you know, sure, it sucks. The feeling of it sucks. And neurons that fire together, wire together, they can get a little bit overactive. But without an awareness of how neurochemicals work and these neurocircuitries work, at least a basic awareness, we can end up feeling like we're doomed or we're stuck in the negativity, um, even though the negativity is there in a way to... Uh, protect us and guide us back to more of these uh, positive rewarding chemicals and survival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Any other negative neurotransmitters? You mentioned cortisol. Are there others that would, might fall into that category? Yeah, like the pain, the pain receptors. I think you could get into the um, the pain, the uh, the ones uh, signaling hunger in a way mm, um, mm. that uh, all play this role. Um, but you know, your brain's looking for ways to turn on the feel good chemicals, like when you see a way to meet a need. Um, but when, then when they wear off, you more notice the, the cortisol, the ones that right. aren't as much in short spurts. Um, and uh, I think the important thing is just to realize that these are trade-offs that are part of life. When you step towards something that's new and exciting and you get the molecule more dopamine, you're mm -hmm. moving away from the safety of social bonds and you feel less oxytocin. Therefore, you get imposter syndrome, like we were talking about last week, or imposter phenomenon. Yeah, or imposter, imposter feelings. feelings. Yeah. And, and, but when you step into more social importance, you get a promotion or whatever, you might be at risk for more disappointment, more cortisol, more strain on your social bonds, less oxytocin, things like that. Yeah. And like you were saying before about, um, you know, being too oversimplified with these neurotransmitters, I don't know that it's, that it's one, the presence of one neurotransmitter that's responsible exclusively for certain mental and emotional states. Um, there's probably synergistic effects, combination effects. You know, I re remember reading in, um, uh, the art of impossible by Stephen Coulter about flow states and the sort of different com neurotransmitter combinations that we think are present when somebody is in flow and brainwave states for that matter, the electrical, you know, waves that our brains put off when we're in different states. Um, but it's a combination of, you know, epinephrine, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin at certain levels that really help you drop in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so then to continue on the feel good neurotransmitter pathway, we talked about dopamine as this joy of expecting a new reward and serotonin mm -hmm. as this like pleasure, pride, um, uh, respect, social importance. Oxytocin, we mentioned briefly, which is the comfort of, of touch, of social trust in mm -hmm. connection, like the safety and numbers we get from our, our tribes. Um, and the brain trusts cautiously, dishes this out carefully um, to promote survival and connection and propagation of species, but to avoid harm. Right. And remember, people talk about oxytocin as sort of the love neurotransmitter. It's the one that's released when uh, mothers are nursing their children, when you hug somebody. Um, but you mentioned like the tribe part. Oxytocin is also the uh, in-group, out-group neurotransmitter, right? That one of the things that helped us survive was identify the enemies. And so um, yeah. sometimes, you know, oxytocin can be present when you're feeling very strong in-group, out-group feelings, which could be argued is, you know, part of the problem in our modern society that's very socially polarized is we are identifying others and treating them as the enemy and oxytocin plays a role in that. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard, uh, I've heard Jamie wheel describe it as the, as the, uh, you know, love yourself and your tribe neurotransmitter, but also the curb stomp your neighbor neurotransmitter, which is a, an awfully memorable <laughs> phrase. And if in, uh, therapy like we can through a excuse me through a neurotransmitter lens you know we can help people who may not have had a sense of safety um, get back to that by just taking small steps towards trust with trusted individuals or corrective experiences because it is in fact not always safe to trust out there in the world but taking right. small steps trusting trustable people, I guess trustworthy mm -hmm. might be the better word, um, helps uh, reward you with more of this oxytocin and more of this positive feeling and moving toward uh, those adaptive, connecting, um, survival promoting um, experiences. Right. Right. And so now I'm thinking about your oil metaphor. When we give a medicine that, that activates, you know, that, that acts on a circuit, uh, that involves a particular neurotransmitter. 
I mean, we, we can't help but mess with what would otherwise be sort of the natural ebb and flow of these circuits, like the natural functioning of these circuits. So is that why you get all these, what you know people call side effects, but are just other effects, undesirable effects of the medicines, just because they're sort of blunt instruments? It, that's, I believe, you know, it's a tricky question um, because I believe that's part of it. But also we forget so often that our frustrating feelings, like it's hard to tease out um, the ebb and flow of a normal mood and sense of safety and comfort and pleasure through daily life with mm -hmm. the effects of medicines. Um, uh, and we can talk about uh, some of the, I think we'll get back to the, what do SSRIs actually do question pretty soon. But I like to remember and remind people that these frustrations we feel through the day are, are really just, it's really just electricity flowing through old pathways and like cortisol triggered when a new experience fits a neural pathway paved by frustrations you've experienced. And that negative feeling will pass. And we do have the power to build new neural networks by um, our behaviors, our thoughts, by focusing our intentions and actions repeatedly on, on other things like behavioral activation and therapy. So we can then turn on dopamine by stepping towards rewarding things. We can do, we can experience more oxytocin by small steps, steps towards trust. We can s get more serotonin by focusing on what we have rather than what we lack. And we can see the difficult feelings like the cortisol as an example, um, just as signals pointing us um, away from the things that are maladaptive or helping give us information of the path we should. It alerts us to potential threats. Um, and we gotta give, ourselves, give our bodies a couple hours to metabolize that. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. I'm not really answering the question. I'm I'm just uh, um, musing about uh, the beautiful complexity of these neurotransmitters that that get way too oversimplified in our <laughs> in our the way we talk about psych meds. Well, it's an it's an honest way of answering the question then, because you know, a question that that asks for a very uh, specific answer that we don't have <laughs> gets an uh -huh. answer uh, that we do have. Right? It's complex, and I should say that you know, as a as a clinical psychologist, somebody who does not prescribe medicines but works in the mental health field as a psychotherapist, I have seen the combination of psychotherapy and antidepressants, anxiolytics, antipsychotics, pick your medicine class, be tremendously helpful for people. I've had clients who were had never tried a psychotropic medicine, had been doing a lot of psychotherapy, uh, feeling frustrated about their progress, and then getting on a medicine that was tremendously helpful and allowed them to make better use of psychotherapy. So um, with my questions, I don't want to give the audience the impression that I'm anti-medicine. I'm I, Hopefully it's mm. obvious that I'm not, given that I also work with, uh, you know, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, but I thought I'd yeah. toss that out there for folks. So here's, here's my best attempt at what an SSRI is doing, right? Mm. So an SSRI, um, is actually targeting just some of the serotonin receptors and causing that reuptake inhibition. And one of them in particular, that's the most relevant is one called 5-HT1A mm. and you'll probably remember from the classic psychedelics that they like LSD psilocybin, for example, they target more of the 5-HT2A, which right. we can talk about. But um, the 5-HT1A receptor, uh, an SSRI will go there and block some of the reuptake, making more serotonin available. And what this does is it um, reduces some functions and enhances some functions. Like what it reduces is a little bit of stress. And this isn't in everyone. It doesn't work in everyone. Um, reduces some stress. It might reduce some impulsivity. It might reduce some aggression, a little bit of anxiety. But what it enhances, um, a couple main things. It enhances a little bit of resilience, which is great. It enhances your emotional blunting, which is not great, right? Mm -hmm. um, so... But we've got serotonin receptors, including 1A and 2A, expressed all over the brain in areas of cognition, areas of social interaction, 
Um, so there are potential implications in like um, the way we think, um, the way we imagine, the way we interact with our emotions. Um, but yeah, the, one of the drawbacks I see of SSRIs is that that part of uh, reduced limbic responsiveness, which can be useful in treatment for up to a point or for a time, mm -hmm. AKA emotional blunting, which we don't want forever in our clients and in ourselves. Right. Yeah. I had a, I had a client this morning <clears throat> describe how SSRIs have helped him. You know, he says, but before his brain was on fire, he just, it was, it was too much, too much anxiety, too much sadness. And he, he even told me like, you've given me a lot of tools, man, but I just haven't been able to use them because uh, the, the, the signal was so loud. And the SSRI just sort of turned the signal down enough. I'm still anxious, still depressed, but it's turned it down enough. It's blunted it enough that now I feel like I can make better use of the tools you've given me. Yeah. No, it's, uh, that's how I see them as well. And, uh, and it's not just serotonergic medicines that are um, that have that story, like mm -hmm. in our, in our clients, like sometimes we'll need a little bit of an anti-anxiety medicine just to tone down that intense alarm bell or fight or flight for a moment in order, like a little bit, at least in order to do some work. Sometimes we need to intervene on sleep because if you haven't slept for months and months because of say trauma, it's hard to get into that um, window, optimal window where you can do the trauma work. Um, and if you look at the history of antidepressants, it hasn't all been serotonin. Like in the 1900s, it was opium uh, mm -hmm. and then amphetamines. And then, and then came the mid, like 1950s came the first uh, serotonin mechanism, the tricyclic antidepressants. When you have SNRIs, right, the norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and there's like different uh, different ways to act on these receptor circuits in the brain, right? Um, yeah. Like one thing I'll say about that emotional blunting. Uh, well, you know, you mentioned using the anti-anxiety medicine just to help calm a person down, and and the real challenge that I see in the use of medicines for the treatment of mental health is just finding that helpful balance of getting a person calm enough to make, as I said before, use of the therapeutic tools, but not, not so blunted that it ruins life in other ways. They're, they become an emotional zombie. That's a phrase you hear our clients use a lot of the medicines aren't giving them their desired effect or with like benzodiazepines with anxiolytics that can be uh, really, really sedating. You don't want people to get addicted, right? You were saying before the brain, has evolved to seek out solutions to these problems to get safe when it feels afraid. So if you have a pill that sort of gives it that, then it's hard to blame it for wanting more and more. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, there are so many different opinions on this, um, even within the field, like you mm -hmm. have um, the hardcore psychopharmacologists helping us understand how to use these and stick to the evidence. And you have the anti-medicine folks, even among psychiatrists like uh, Kelly Brogan, for example, mm -hmm. who's, who has an important um, opinion, you know, to, if you can set aside um, some of the things that are like personally triggering to me of taking such an extreme view, like there's an important uh, voice there pulling us towards balance. And uh, even in the book that we all love and everyone loves, The Body Keeps the Score, uh, mm -hmm. Bessel van der Kolk, a psychiatrist, is pretty anti-benzodiazepine in that book. Um, but I, I'll tell you, just like you said, in my clinical experience, especially when I've worked with uh, torture victim refugees and human trafficking subjects for a mm -hmm. long time, some of the worst trauma I've ever, ever heard about, and people who haven't slept for a very long time, and uh, the retelling of their trauma was was just so intense, even, even for me to hear and, and try and hold it with them that, mm -hmm. yeah, sometimes we need, we've needed a little whiff of a benzo or a little sprinkle of an antipsychotic in order to even begin to do the work. But those are temporary interventions. And I get that there's a slippery slope there and you don't want to, you don't want to be on these things long-term if at all possible. <laughs> 
Yeah. Then I think that's where a lot of the criticism comes is, you know, you get somebody walking into your office that's been put on seven different medicines and three of the seven are to handle the side effects of, of the first ones. And, um, you know, I think we want to get away from that kind of pharmacological approach that, uh, you got that symptom. I got a pill for that symptom. You got this symptom. Let's get another pill for that symptom. I think you'd agree. Pouring, right? Like, yeah. Pouring buckets of oil all over. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, s s contrast the SSRI to psilocybin, for example, mm -hmm. you know, where, where we've done studies of SSRI, SNRIs for depression. We've, we just did a study of psilocybin for depression mm -hmm. and psilocybin, um, that you take not in a daily way, you take once or twice or three times during a typical study protocol separated by you know, usually weeks if there if there's even going to be more than one dose, mm -hmm. um, that targets the five HT two A receptor uh, rather than the one A receptor. Um, kind of a a subtle difference in the receptor anatomy, but a big difference in the outcome because um, what it does and and sure it's not a reuptake inhibitor. It it's an agonist causing a release of serotonin, so it's more dramatic. And uh, there's, I guess, uh, an increase in what you'd call cortical entropy, um, uh, you know, a scientific term. The, you could call it chaos, a beautiful chaos, and a decrease in the rigidity. Um, there's someone honking outside. Can you hear that? I guess you're in the same building. <laughs> uh, we'll see if it comes up on the podcast because that's the longest honk I've heard in a long time. I know. That was either a very angry person or somebody passed out on their steering wheel. I've... We'll wave to them. Yeah. Good luck, sir. There they are again. Oh, they're they're fired up. They're driving away with the honk. Their limbic responsiveness is on board. I was going to say, which neurotransmitters are flooding their brain right now? <laughs> Aggression. Yes. Um, so uh, I think I've I think I've given this exercise maybe on the podcast before, but when I used to teach uh, some. Uh, college students and med students about like fight or flight response, neurotransmitters, polyvagal theory, things like that. I would, uh, for a while, I was instructing this rather kind of bold homework assignment that probably isn't the best uh, from a liability standpoint, but I'd say, okay, on your way home, um, when you're driving in your car at a stoplight, um, at a red light, when someone's behind you, wait for it to turn green and don't go. Just sit there. Take your pulse and notice what's happening to your neurotransmitters and make sure they've got a chance to honk and mm -hmm. notice what happens as you sit there. And then you can wave and thank them and drive on and hopefully not, no one gets injured. But it is really interesting to see what, what can happen, what can shift in an instance in situations like, like we just experienced. Right. I like that. I like that exercise. I think they're, you know, I've, I've done similar exercises for my clients. One, one that I like to do is tell them to go into a convenience store and ask for a discount. Mm -hmm. Um, I had somebody with social anxiety do this the other day. Uh, there's a, there was a gas station near our office and said, okay, as soon as you walk out of this session, I'm going to watch you out of my window. <laughs> I want you to go to that Seven Eleven, and I want you to get whatever, a soda or something. And I want you to ask for a 10% discount. And when the, when the person says, huh, why, uh, just say, I don't know, just thought I'd ask. Mm -hmm. And this, this client of mine totally did it. And it was, you know, he was super activated, very anxious. Um, and then he felt triumph. He felt euphoria actually afterward. Mm -hmm. So maybe a rush of those more positive neurotransmitters. The, uh, the good triggers, huh? Mm -hmm. I think there's something to that. I, I try to practice that in day-to-day -day life and uh by going into activities or classes that are outside of my comfort zone like mm -hmm. you know i've done that with uh with dance class for example taking a jump from the yoga world to you know, like advanced contemporary dance being the worst in the room or yeah, like you, yeah. you, you've heard some of the stoics give it like some of the stoic enthusiasts give advice um, that you should go out sometimes terribly inappropriately or underdressed just to not care so much about what people think, like do it on purpose now and then 
of uh, going barefoot to the grocery store or um, wearing your pajamas or whatever it is, um, because I do think we harbor a lot of unnecessary fear around that kind of discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. Especially social rejection fear, which again, speaking from an evolutionary perspective is understandable. It was important and still is for us to be accepted by our peers and our, our quote unquote tribe. But yeah, in our modern era, those fears that were adaptive can become pretty maladaptive and, uh, signaled and triggered unnecessarily. So these exercises are good at sort of recalibrating that fear. Mm -hmm. Um, so before the honk, we were talking about psilocybin and I should, I should confess that, uh, psilocybin isn't just hitting the 5-HD2A receptor Mm. as an agonist. It's also hitting lots of other receptors, like, um, mostly 5-HT1A, like Prozac is messing with in a different way, Mm -hmm. a very different way. 5-HT2C, for example. Um, But what's interesting is among the classic psychedelics like LSD as another classic psychedelic that we oversimplify and say that it it is a 5-HT2A mechanism of action, it's also hitting all of those ones that psilocybin does and a bunch of others like 5-HT2B, like dopamine, D1, Mm -hmm. D2, D4. And uh, I've heard psilocybin called a promiscuous psychedelic because it's uh, it's connecting with all the receptors out there, all these ones we listed, and probably more. LSD or psilocybin is the LSD promiscuous one. LSD is more promiscuous, okay. polyamorous. <laughs> yeah, monogamish LSD. You, yeah, uh, you kinky molecule, you. But DMT is pretty. Uh, near monogamous as a psychedelic uh, hitting just like 5-HD2A and 1A for the most part. Mm. So DMT is a more chaste psychedelic, whereas Mm -hmm. LSD and psilocybin more promiscuous. Got it. Yeah. But therefore, this is kind of interesting that the more receptors you have on board, the more symptomatology in general might be involved. Like, Mm -hmm. um, sure, they can both decrease depression if used in the right way. Um, but with LSD, because of these receptors, um, that are being hit, like, um, you might get more potential for anxiety, more potential for aggression, even though we're using LSD soon for an anxiety study and with good Mm -hmm. rationale and good early data, like talking about during the experience when that, uh, when those receptors are unleashed for a moment, and you also might have more like you know, a little more of these different types of learning or a little longer of a window of neuroplasticity because of how these work a little differently. Right. What about um, MDMA, right? Not a classic psychedelic. Uh, we, we concluded under this broad umbrella of psychedelics. What is it doing in the brain? Yeah, that's a, that's a fun one. So I'd say at least three, probably at least four neurotransmitters are involved. It's increasing the activity of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and oxytocin. And therefore, increasing your social soci- sociability, your feelings of safety and trust, and um, decreasing the social anxiety, increasing your ability to speak your truth and revisit traumas, um, and interestingly, you also have uh, from, you know, incidentally, you've got some cortisol increased from MDMA. It's a, it's a psychostimulant as well. And some mm-hmm. vasopressin release and um, some, uh, yeah, it's just a completely different mechanism. And I've heard that, um, people say MDMA uh, compared to the other psychedelics is the one we worry about with respect to neurotoxicity that it can be um, excitotoxic to, to the neurons, especially if used chronically. Yeah, b- because it is chemically more, much, much more related to the amphetamines. And, mm-hmm. uh, and it works in a different way. Like it inhibits the reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine, and it uh, makes more serotonin available through this like CERT inhibition, like a different mechanism. But, um, but the one study that 
pointed to it the most um, as a potential neurotoxic medicine was recalled because they later confessed, discovered that they were looking at meth and not MDMA. And this big, often cited study was then recalled and invalidated. Um, sure, there is potential neurotoxicity, but but MAPS has done just so much work around at the doses we use it and the frequency we use it for PTSD treatment, like two or three treatment sessions spaced a few weeks apart and in doses up to like say under 200 milligrams per dosing session, um, you get all these benefits with very little risk of uh, the negative. Yeah, the, the the little bit of the research that I've looked at, most of it was rat studies, like rat or mouse models, and they're giving them a lot of this medicine. Um, or it was uh, on the population that abuses the medicine, abuses meaning, you know, uses it daily or... You know, uses it in a way that's dysfunctional. So yeah, I mean the the poison is in the dose, as they say. Yeah, yeah, but I uh, yeah I do think there's there's a lot to that because even in the map studies, the clients aren't given as part of the protocol uh, role safe kits or those vitamins mm -hmm. that people take before and after that have great rationale. By the way, if someone's going to but they would need to be taking them on their own and tell the study teams that they are taking them and make sure it's not disallowed by the protocol. Um, but even then, um, at these doses, um, in individuals who have their labs and general health and EKG screened, uh, MDMA is, when used in this way, is um, an exceedingly safe medicine. And mm -hmm. uh, also... Um, strikingly helpful for PTSD and some of the other things that's been studied for. Yeah. And, you know, one, I've heard people, I think last person I heard this from was Rick Doblin, but describe another way that it's a particularly effective medicine for PTSD is, uh, he's describing it in terms of brain regions it activates. So, you know, uh, activation in the prefrontal cortex, increasing ability to think rationally about things and reflect, decreasing activity in the limbic system or the amygdala. So it's decreasing fear and arousal in response to traumatic memories for, for the time being, and then increasing connectivity between prefrontal cortex and hippocampal regions of the brain. So you're getting better access to memory, uh, mm -hmm. memory retrieval, and then reprocessing of memory. And I'm sure this is an oversimplification. I'm not a neuroscientist, but uh -huh. I, I like that explanation if there's any truth to it. Cause it, it's like, if I had to design, um, a PTSD medicine to be used in conjunction mm -hmm. with therapy, it would do that. Right. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. Cause you have this like sense of well being, enhanced interpersonal closeness, more empathy towards self and others, including your, your, supports your treatment team and reduce distress in response to these things that are happening, like talking about your trauma and the pro sociality that comes. Mm. And you've got this introspection, emotional connection, emotional openness. I've heard it called in uh, some papers, even um, post-traumatic growth promoting, which mm. I, I quite like, like post trauma, positive changes in the way we relate to self and others. Right. Um, right. But you know what's interesting is uh, MDMA has been studied well oh, and published on in well over 2,000 people. Um, it's been used by way more than that, of course, but um, in MDMA research um, and in the early MAP studies, they were giving doses of over 250 milligrams in some of the early studies, phase one, two, and still no unexpected serious events. There's always this expectation of transient, self-limiting, increasing your heart rate, blood pressure, um, but not any different than like moderate exercise would bring. It was even studied in like four times the study doses, say like a thousand milligrams or upwards mm. of that. And it just, you had less serotonin brain production for two weeks, but then it did return to baseline. And is that what the roll safe kits you're talking about, like the 5-HTP and the, these um, these serotonin precursors that people will take after going to a festival and, and doing ecstasy? It's to try to replenish serotonin because it does uh, sort of yeah. exhaust the serotonin receptors. And it's uh, and it's 
like precursors and building blocks and um but and also in the roll safe kits are some um neuroprotective ingredients like some might have ginger or acetylcysteine or um, so vitamin any C. any oxidants right because there's an oxidative stress that maybe happens in the brain with mdma i've, I've read yeah yeah that psychostimulant and if you go to roll safe org they do a great job of summarizing the research and the rationale for these uh, what's in these kits um, and uh, so I think that's I think that's great in addition to giving really helpful advice of uh, like hydration and preventing severe electrolyte imbalances things like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not mixing it with certain things that could be harmful because while at these study doses in a controlled setting, where everyone's meds are known and all the instructions are very clear, serotonin sy syndrome is avoided. It is a theoretical risk out there if someone's on a boatload of um, serotonin promoting things and then you go take a boatload of something like this. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's a reason to be really cautious, folks. Of course, we don't condone, condone any illegal activity, but people who go to festivals and they're getting drugs from unknown sources, a pill that's pressed with like a smiley face on it or whatever, you don't you don't know what's in it, right? Your buddy who yeah. got it from a guy who claims this is the best ecstasy ever, it could have fentanyl and cocaine and then no ecstasy. Like you you just don't yeah. know. So uh, you're, you're rolling the dice when you're taking an unidentified medicine. And those, those press tablets of ecstasy, MDMA is what people on the street would say is molly, right? Mm -hmm. And still, you don't know if you're not getting it in a, like in a controlled healthcare study setting. Of course, you don't know what's in it. There are test kits that can be really helpful. But the ecstasy press tablets are by default, uh, like you said, full of stimulants and, um, and a bunch of different ones, whether it's... Uh, cocaine, Adderall, or bath salts. But there was this study um, a number of years ago that showed some cardiac abnormalities in ecstasy, recreational ecstasy users. Um, but what's interesting is that those users had a lifetime average of like 900 tablets. Mm -hmm. And uh, who knows what the threshold was, but it shows you that uh, there is a, like a burden of uh, of taking these medicines in too high of a dose, especially over time. Right. Right. Um, so we didn't talk about ketamine yet. Do we want to briefly talk about ketamine as a psychedelic in the brain? Sure. Do you want to start or would you like me to? You're the doctor. I know that, uh, uh <laughs> yeah, ketamine, we call it this dissociative anesthetic. It has this different kind of mechanism of action in the brain acting on, is it glutamate? receptors? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the main and most often cited mechanism is, um, is glutamate or glutamatergic, uh, because ketamine blocks these NMDA receptors. Um, it's more complicated than just like simple block receptor increase, uh, glutamate. There's some GABA inhibition in the, in mm -hmm. the middle of that equation, but that's kind of not really relevant to our oversimplification discussion here. And, but what that does is, and I'd call that mechanism number one, NMDA receptor blockade would be, uh, the effect would be rapid improvements in mood um, by restoring this glutamatergic signaling, the glutamate being the most uh, prevalent neurotransmitter in the brain. It's kind of like you're, you're uh, rebooting the brain or, or re- or jumping your car battery to restart your car and letting it communicate more freely again. Yeah. Like a control alt delete for the brain's operating system. Defrag. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, another part of that is, um, ketamine is interrupting this connection. If we look at it from a brain circuit standpoint and a brain pathway, it's interrupting the connection between the cortex and limbic system, uh, which decreases rumination, like it, which d down regulates the default mode network. And therefore you get this time out from your overthinking monkey mind and your excessive rumination, the higher the dose, the more that slows down. And, and eventually you're in anesthesia land, which is mm -hmm. a little perhaps too toned down if you're trying to do cap, 
but uh, or ketamine assisted psychotherapy. But but yeah, it's a really interesting mechanism. Yeah, and I, I love talking about it because people often ask us like, hey, like once psilocybin and LSD become and MDMA becomes federally legalized and approved for the treatment of mental health issues, you think you guys will just stop doing ketamine? Um, and the answer is no. Ketamine no. itself has unique properties that make it a very, very powerful medicine. Yeah, it, it is. And, and to give you an example, one, one other mechanism um, that I like to point out, um, and this comes from like a really I think high impact nature paper back a few years ago um, about the lateral habenular burst mode that burst ketamine mode, blocks. Yeah. yeah, but the lateral habenula is this little part of the brain that connects the limbic system, which processes our processes our emotions, and uh, and that goes and inhibits our positive emotions. Like it's not letting us feel things like serotonin and dopamine as much. And in this burst mode, which happens to a lot of us in stressed out everyday life and full of lots of cortisol, um, we're overstressed and depressed. And ketamine can come in and just like hit that button, hold it down, reboot. So you're out of burst mode, at least temporarily, which can be a dramatic change in your mood overnight, like a big cloud is lifting off of you. I like to leverage this effect with my clients with OCD because, you know, most of my clients who I do cap with who have OCD will say that uh, during and shortly after the ketamine experience is one of the only times they feel what it's like to have their obsessions quieter or at least uh, yeah. inter like that they're the, the part of them that is obsessed with the thing and that drives the compulsion is willing to, to relax a bit. So this sort of hard reset and relaxed thoughts and slowed down uh, provides a great therapeutic window to do the work we need to do with somebody who has obsessive and compulsive issues. Yeah. And all of these, ketamine included, MDMA included, classic psychedelics included, do um, enhance or open up a window of neuroplasticity, um, which is, or you could look at it as a critical period of enhanced learning. Uh, mm -hmm. that we can use therapeutically. Yeah, I love the, uh, I remember seeing that research presented at, was it Horizons where we saw Gould yeah. Dolan's research and the, that that uh, that graph that we've screenshot and shared with a lot of people of these social learning mm -hmm. critical periods that these different psychedelics open. And um, what was the longest one? Was it Ibogaine? Yeah, yeah, it was interesting. Like two weeks? Four, Um because the duration, the half-life of these medicines correlated in a really cool way with the estimated duration of the window of um, this critical period or window of opportunity that was open where ketamine might be two days and um, MDMA, psilocybin, like two weeks and things like LSD, Ibogaine, um, more in that three to four weeks plus range. Right, right. Well, Reed, we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, this is a very complicated topic, and of course, uh, we covered it exhaustively. And our mm -hmm. listeners now know all they will ever need to know about neuroscience, mental health, and psychedelics. Um, anything else you want to say before we wrap it up? No, I think, uh, I think. well, maybe one reminder, we're on this topic of neuroplasticity and this idea that neurons that fire together, wire together. And the more our brains practice certain pathways, the better these pathways get at doing that thing, like going to the gym. And so that's the beauty of the brain that I just want to present to us as another, another neurotransmitter or neuroscience life hack, because the beauty mm -hmm. of our brains is that we can learn new tricks. And through practice, we can create new pathways. We reinforce them through repetition. Um, and we do all end up with pathways that we'd rather not be traveling down all the time. Um, but by choosing new behaviors, by um, working on the internal content in our minds and persisting in that, this electricity zips down those pathways. The feel-good chemicals are linked more and more to those behavior thoughts patterns, and we start to feel better. So that's, I think, the last little practical nugget I'll, I'll end with. Yeah, it's a, a nugget that gives great hope. Human beings are adaptation machines and we can change. All right, folks, go out there and do some changing. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. 
Thank you, dear listener, for listening. It means a lot to me. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Novamind, a mental health company that specializes in psychedelic medicine and research. You can learn more about Novamind's mission to increase access to legal, safe, and evidence-based psychedelic medicine at novamind.ca. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen or watch. Also, if you're feeling generous today, please leave us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. If you'd like to reach out to us with questions, suggestions, scathing criticisms, etc., please email us at psychfrontiers at novamind.ca. Thanks again. The content of this podcast does not constitute medical advice or mental health treatment. Please consult a medical or medical